And Happy New Year to everyone. I'm Chef AJ, and you're listening to Healthy Living. My guest tonight is Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Dr. Campbell is a longtime professor from Cornell University who has spent his entire professional career doing experimental research with his many students and colleagues on the effects of food on human health. He also has served on several expert panels to develop national and international food and health policy that led him to publish, along with his physician's son, Dr. Tom Campbell, their groundbreaking book, The China Study, which the New York Times called the, epidemiolo- the Grand Prix of all epidemiological studies. This, in turn, led to the making of the wildly popular documentary film, Forks Over Knives, and as a follow-up, his eldest son, Nelson, has just finished directing a new film with the producer, John Curry, of Forks Over Knives. It's going to be released on July 4th, 2014. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Dr. Campbell. It's a pleasure. Finally, I get yeah. we get it straightened out. Yeah. yeah, and if you're listening to this call, please, you, there's background noise. We have to ask you to please mute yourself, everyone but Dr. Campbell. Please, press star six. There's somebody on with a lot of background noise. Please. Okay, we'll have to do our best. Okay, so Dr. Campbell, one of the first questions, because I imagine it's after dinner by you, right? You're, you're three hours later in New York. Correct. So one of the first questions, it's a little silly, but I'm interested. What did you have for dinner? Uh, it was uh, kale and beans, wow. mm. just right up your alley. And sounds good. Uh, yeah. That sounds delicious. So people always seem to be interested in what our guests eat every day and if they exercise. I imagine you eat pretty healthy, and you have a lot of people in your family that join you. Yeah, there's actually 18 of us now. Three of us are still uh, very small children, just babies. But the other 15 of us, all of us do the same thing. Well, it must be amazing because, you know, I I remember when Dr. Uh, McDougal spoke at Healthy Taste of L.A., he was saying one of the secrets to his success is he's like Mary. You have your own Mary, a, a lovely wife who's been married to a really long time, Karen. What role has she played in helping you sustain this lifestyle? Every conceivable way. She actually has, I mean, when we when I started to get into this, in a sense, from the research that we were doing in the late 1970s and early 1980s, she started changing then uh, the recipes that she had been using, uh, you know, bit by bit over the next 10 years or so. And finally... Along about 10 years later, I think somewhere around 1990, 1991, uh, we were virtually there. And uh, she has really just led the charge, actually, uh, as to what we eat And you have ever five, since. you have five kids? Five children and eight grandchildren. Five of them are now, uh, all actually all five are now in college. The three younger ones are just born in the last couple of years. Wow. Uh, and but they, and so they were born They all do the same thing. But 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 your your grandchildren were born following a plant based diet, right? Uh, mostly the older ones, yeah, that's right. They they mostly were raised that way. Uh, three of them, I think. Yeah, they all five really were. Uh, okay. No meat, no dairy. Aren't you worried about where they get their protein? I'm being facetious, of course. <laughs> uh, not at all. Uh, I mean, that was my. Uh, specialty, if you will, uh, early in my career was the whole question concerning, you know, how much protein do we need, what kind should it be, uh, and then in turn how that r- might relate to cancer, which was a second sort of uh, discipline that I was following, you know, basically how cancer works in the, at the biochemical level. So, yeah, so I've been deeply involved in this, and we don't worry about protein. Well, how surprised were you, you know, being raised on a dairy farm that, you know, your life's blood literally would turn into something that you actually don't recommend now? Was that very surprising to you? Uh, yes, actually, in the, in the very beginning, it was not quite believable. Uh, but because it was so strange at the time uh, and because the, the evidence that we were getting early on, uh, along with uh, a colleague of, or sort of a person that I knew from India, uh, the, the evidence was so powerful, so strong, that you could I could, you couldn't just drop it. Uh, you know, if I didn't like it, that wasn't a choice. It, it it was so strong, and so we I got some money from the National Institutes of Health, and was very successful in getting rather generous amounts of funding for the next 27 years uh, to do this research. And the more we sort of examined it, the more profound it became. It, I, I think maybe it took me. 
from the beginning of that research program, it took me maybe I don't know three or four or five years before I finally said, "Hey, this this is this is this is the real thing." And we just got to bite the bullet and go with it. Did your colleagues that you mentioned that were doing the research with you were they as compelled by the research findings as you were? No, not in the beginning because uh, the the colleagues that I'm speaking about during that time, for the most part, were postdoctoral and doctoral students, PhD students some on, uh, undergraduate honor students. And so they were all sort of uh, looking at pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, mm-hmm. and working on those questions, you know, in considerable depth. And so they weren't necessarily seeing the whole, but uh, not to blame them, because, because quite frankly, I wasn't seeing the whole either. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we were just doing these bits and pieces and and seeing how remarkable were the results, and they were repeatable uh, they were published extensively in the very best journals, and so uh, it, and there came a time, at least in my career personally, that I started to have to sort of knit these ideas together. And much of my, many of my students by that time were already gone on to their own careers. I would imagine sure, some of them, mm-hmm. some of them have kept up with me, and they they know what I've gotten into. So <laughs> it, that's true. <laughs> I would imagine that your po- your findings weren't as popular with with some of your colleagues and actually with with the food industry in general. No, that's absolutely true. Um, I've been most of the time at Cornell University. The first ten years I was at Virginia Tech uh, when I was doing this work, but then uh, from 1975 onwards I was at Cornell, and uh, eventually I had the largest research program actually in the department that was had long been ranked number one in the country. So it's a good department, a big department, and I had a big program and lots of students, and it was all very exciting. I, I uh, enjoyed my time immensely. I, I really like science. I love working with students and, and all of that. But then eventually, around about 1990, I guess, 1992, 93, uh, then I started talking more publicly about it, especially when the New York Times wrote a, a uh, cover story in their science section, and I think it was 1990, and uh, said some things that were pretty pretty profound and provocative, I guess you could say. I had, as I said, a great career uh, you know, for most of those years. It was a great deal of fun, and I was at that time, too, very much in the scientific community, if, if you will, and I was on expert panels and doing a lot of sort of policy work in Washington, and, and uh, it was great life. It was just, just lots of fun, but when I started talking more publicly about what these findings really meant as I was sort of knitting these ideas together in some fascinating ways, that's when they started letting me know, hey, don't go there. You know, you're still involved, though, with Cornell. In eCornell, you have that wonderful course in plant-based nutrition that I'm a graduate of. How do people find out more about that course, and what is that course in case there's somebody listening that doesn't know about it? Well, for one thing, I started that course, by the way, on the campus. Uh, in the classroom, and I did it for uh, seven years, actually. It was very popular uh, from my perspective. The students liked it a lot, and I was quite excited about offering this new kind of information. I learned, though, too, that this was the first and only course of its kind in any university in the entire country. Uh, So it was pretty provocative, to say the least, but it was popular. And eventually, uh, I won't get into all the details, uh, we ended up putting it online with the Cornell program the Cornell online program, which at that time was emerging as a new kind of program. And so we got on there, and and I think eCornell had more than 200 courses uh, essentially by now, and we're ranked number one out of the 200. That's fantastic. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, we've we've had great success with that. It's uh, The course also is available for continuing medical education credits for doctors and, and related health professionals. Uh, so uh, it's been a great run. It's really been a great run, um, and uh, it's still available. Dr. Dr. Campbell, what I especially loved about your course was the interactiveness and, and some of the assignments that were not, not just the quizzes, but the writing assignments. I thought those were really useful in my career. You know, So anybody that's wanting to be a plant-based educator or that's doing anything in this field, I think it's really an important course for them to take. Yeah, thank you for the plug. We are excited about it, too. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just wonderful. I mean, and it, it, it's um, you know, I mean, the, the, the your books are great, but the course it's it's just it's it just really helps drive these principal homes home, and it really helps solidify them in in the knowledge of of especially those of us that want to teach this stuff and articulate it to other people. It's a very well done course. 
Well, thank you. By the way, I ought to say that the course is run by a nonprofit organization of ours uh, that's headed now by my son, Tom. That's the physician. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also we have a good staff working on that, uh, you know, in partnership with uh, the Cornell Group. And uh, so what we really want to do is to expand it, to offer more courses. But we, at this point in time, uh, we can't quite do that because we need some funding to do it. Uh, we're paying our way, and it's been successful that way, but we don't have a, really any excess funding to do it. But we're, I just want to mention that because if somebody's out there that might be able to help yeah. a little bit from time right. to time, that would be so helpful. If there's any rich people listening, please donate generously now. <laughs> you mentioned- I, I should say also I get no funding myself, so it's not a personal project that way. Right. You mentioned your son, Tom, your co-author on the China study. Now, we're going to be interviewing him on March 5th. He's got his own book coming out. But how exciting that must be for you to have him. That he actually went to medical school as a result of writing this book. Is that not correct? Yeah, he was uh, in theater. He was doing very well in theater, actually, really spectacularly well. He's on stage in Chicago. and But he wasn't making any money in that business. So he came back to work with me in the hopes he could get some funding to continue his his acting career, but he got so excited about this material that he decided to go back to med school. He did. He finished up his residency, and now he's a family doc. He's on the faculty at the University of Rochester Medical Center, has his own clinic, and also directs our our online program. So, yeah, it, it's very exciting, but he's only one of, I don't know what it is now, about seven or eight of our family who are doing their own projects. It's all very exciting. Yeah, and, um, and, and your your oldest son Nelson was the director of your movie that comes out on July fourth of this year, which is a release date. Hopefully, you'll be showing that at Vegetarian Summerfest. Tell us the name of the movie and a little bit about it. Yeah, it's plant. It's called Plant Pure Nation, uh, and he is working with the uh, the former uh, producer of Forks Over Knives, John Corey, who's an absolutely a talented, terrific guy, uh, along with um, Lee Fulkerson, the tall guy you may have seen in the film mm-hmm. Forks Over Knives. Uh-huh. And he's got some other people working with him, obviously the camera people and so forth and so on. In any case, this second film, uh, let me say back up just for a second. Forks Over Knives uh, was an attempt to basically describe what we learned, just bring it to the attention of the public. Obviously what we did, what Dr. Esselstyn did, Dr. McDougal, and many, many others. And so we kind of laid it out. Here's the story, guys. Uh, but we didn't really spend too much time on explaining you know, why people hadn't heard this before. Well, Force of an Eyes has done terrifically well in the last three years since it went into theater. And then uh, this second film is designed to explain, if you will, um, on camera, uh, why people haven't heard it before. And we had a tremendous opportunity to kick that off by uh, my being invited to lecture on the floor of the Kentucky legislature. Uh, And uh, my friend came along, too, uh, Dr. Esselton. So the two of us were there. We made our presentations. We actually got a standing ovation from the 100 representatives of that state legislature. It's all very exciting. And then after that, uh, there were 89 of the 100 who sponsored a non-binding resolution, uh, basically inviting my oldest son, Nelson, and I to come in and uh, help them sort of redesign much of the health care program if possible. Uh, It was all very exciting. That was all on film. But then it went to committee, and when it went to the committee to get some money, uh, and it, that's when the lobbyists came out of the woodwork, and they actually killed it, they killed that bill. Uh, and that was sort of like the beginning of the film. I won't say much more than that, but that's just sort of the start of it. And the rest of it is, in parts, really quite dramatic. And everything is on film that really occurred. And well, so did, it's, a, it's a film of a different kind, but it's exciting. I look forward to seeing it. Did you ever think here you were a researcher, a professor at Cornell University, that one day you would become this, this rock star, this movie star? I mean, you've been in more films than, than Forks Over Knives. You're now in a new film. You were, uh, you were the first guest on my new television show, Healthy Living with Chef AJ. You've been on Bill Maher. I mean, do, do, you, like, do you like the media side of this? Do you like being in television and film? Well, I don't think so much about whether I'm on film or not on film, on stage or not on stage, or just sitting around the living room. Uh, I, I mean, I feel like I'm hoping to, I'm being myself wherever I happen to be. Uh, uh-huh. What really gets me excited is just telling the story and getting reaction from people, hearing their views, and especially hearing their experiences. Gosh, uh-huh. the experiences people have when they do this is, is through the roof. And so I've gotten very excited about the, the idea that, that, um, that it's, it's time has come. 
And uh, it's a very powerful idea, as you know, A.J., uh-huh. Uh, and I'm sure many of the caller, the listeners are, are aware of that as well. And so uh, the more I got into it, I then decided to write a second book called Whole, W-H-O-L-E, right. in which I'm trying to sort of deal a little bit digger, a little bit deeper into the sort of philosophical and economic and social uh, and historical, to some extent, background for why we haven't heard this before. Sort of like the new film, Plant Fear Nation. And uh, I'm just coming to realization that I guess in a sense, uh, well, I know this is true, we are really seriously challenging the entire scientific community in the area of medicine and right. health. Uh, and I find that very exciting. I, my uh, colleagues, uh, I might say my former colleagues, to some extent, they are too happy with some of this. But uh, I know it's right, and uh, I'm going to keep on pushing it. Uh, and so... Uh, we're going to get it right. I, I just know it works. And as many of you on listening to this uh, call knows it works right as well. So I'm not giving up. I'm keeping on going. Well, that's right, because, you know, you have a very big, I don't know if I'm allowed, you know, they always say it's not polite to ask a woman's age, but I know you've got a very big birthday coming up in a couple of months. So I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but, you know, we need you around. Yeah, you can. Well, you're going to be 80 <laughs> on March 14th. So it's no, I'm, you're, 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 no, that's that's the, that's when I was young. Okay. I'm 81. <laughs> Wait, you you mean you're 80 already? Yes, I am. I'm eight, I'll be 81 on March 14. Oh, so you're already 80. Well, you're you're still you're three months younger than Dr. Esselstyn, though, right? That's right. I like to point out that he's my yeah. senior. <laughs> that's that's funny. So so what we can ask for for your birthday is they can give generously to the foundation. That would be probably the best present. Oh, of that'd all. be fantastic. Yeah, that would really be fantastic. That's, that's yeah. what you want. You know, you mentioned the book Hole, and one of the questions from one of the listeners was if you could talk about the book hole and your inspiration for it, but I'm holding your book hole in my hand. And I always, whenever I give a presentation and I'm doing, talking about the science, I open up page seven book hole. And here you say, the ideal human diet looks like this. Consume plant-based foods in forms as close to their natural state as possible in parentheses, in quote, whole foods, eat a variety of vegetables, fruits, raw nuts and seeds, beans and legumes and whole grains. Avoid heavily processed foods and animal products. Stay away from added salt, oil, and sugar. Aim to get 80% of your calories from carbohydrates, 10% from fat, and 10% from protein. That's it in 66 words. And when I read that, I say to myself, why do we even need any, why, don't, why do we need a book? Isn't that basically it? Yeah, but they need to buy the book, AJ. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I, no I'm, I'm teasing you. No, it's it's uh yeah it is. I mean the message is really quite simple. I, I I do like to say that you know the biology from the scientific point of view is is just infinitely complex, infinitely complex on the one hand. But on the other hand, the message that we can take away, you know, from all of that, you just read it. It's mm-hmm. the 66 words. Right. It's, and, I love uh, it. It's pretty, you know, pretty you, simple. You mentioned buying the book, and I want to tell a little story. When Dr. Campbell came to New York, graciously driving all the way to be on my new television show, I had asked him to bring copies of his book that we could show on air, but he forgot to do that. Well, we, you know, the show must go on. And so you went, you drove to the closest Barnes and Noble and you were able to find copies of your books in the bookstore. Now, I'm just curious, when you bought them, did they know who you were? Like, you know, did they know you were buying your own book in the bookstore? No, because I was in a hurry to get back to your show, and I didn't want to say say who I was and end up in a conversation. So, no, <laughs> I didn't tell him that. But how cool is that? That we were, and that no matter where you are in the United States, you were able to walk in the store and buy 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 whole and buy the buy the China study. So that's pretty cool. When um, what was your inspiration for writing Whole? Well, uh, you know, it's most personal and professional, I guess. Uh, I mean, we all have. I'm sure everyone listened to the show. We've got family members that. Uh, probably left left us uh, too soon and at too young of an age. Uh, my wife's mother uh, passed away at 51. My dad at 70 with a, with a heart problem and and so forth and so on. And, and so we have our personal reasons. I, I think, you know, if only we had known. I mean, that's one of the motivations I have from a personal level. If only we had known uh, mm-hmm. what we know now. You know, those uh, early departures didn't have to happen. On the other hand, as far as the... Uh, research was concerned, uh, I've been deeply involved in science, as you know, and, and uh, I, I really like science. I like to work at, at, at you know, some of the deeper levels, down to the atomic and molecular levels, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it's like a great puzzle you're trying to put together. And I finally just came across this concept that 
I'm now really excited about it, how, you know, that the whole concept of nutrition is not really a discussion of the effect of individual nutrients. It's not that. That just creates a lot of confusion and argument. But what it is is everything working together, and it's hard to explain it on this one show, but it does work together. The body, in, ta- in turn, uh, is a marvelous, marvelous um, sort of, um, I hate to say use the word instrument, but it's, it's a, it's, it, it can, in fact, make its own decisions, if you will, if I can say it that way, as to what you know, it needs, uh, how much it needs, where to take it to, how to use it. I mean, it's, it's really life itself. Well, and you, uh, I, so that that inspires me. I mean, I think uh, just just thinking about somehow, I, I, I'm just incidentally, I'm just writing the second edition of the China study that's coming out hopefully soon, and uh, we're trying to really uh, go back and add some new material. And I've just been writing about this concept of, you know, why there has been so much confusion and why there's some kickback, and and at the same time, and the way I try to visualize this is to sort of suggest to people if they just could know enough about it, if they could just imagine themselves inside of one of our 10 to 100 trillion cells yeah. and just sort of stand there and look around, and, and then you can see life at its origin, right. you know, biologically, biologically speaking. It's, it's amazing. And when you, when you're, if you're able to do that, you know, it works a lot inside of the cells, so to speak, then, I mean, everything just becomes just an awesome, awesome display of, of nature. I think that your your book, The China Study, has really helped more people transition to a plant-based diet than just about any other resource out there. Because until it came along, I know for myself, being plant-based for almost 40 years, nothing I could really say would convince people. But with that book, you don't even have to say anything. You just If they won't buy it, you just buy them a copy and they read it. And I find... You know, because people seem to like to know the science. They want they want proof. And I think what your book, The China Study, really does for people is gives them that scientific proof, what they're looking for, you know? Yeah, well, that, of course, was my background, and that's what I got excited about. Right. And I, I wasn't sure when we wrote it. And, of course, I wrote it with my youngest son, Tom, as, as you know. When when we wrote it, we were talking about how to formulate this idea, how to – how to you know present the narrative in a way in which it could be understood, and I could never be sure that we had accomplished that or not, even when we were done writing it. And so it's you know a little bit of a crapshoot, uh, but then it turned out that um, apparently it resonates and it's really done well, it's exceedingly well. Is it? It's is it? Fun. I just had a curiosity. I know a lot of a lot of best-selling books are tr- eventually translated into other languages. Is the China Study available in Chinese? <laughs> Oh yes, in fact, it's, a, it's been translated, and, and I don't know what the last count is—at least thirty different languages. That's fantastic. Uh, there's two different Chinese versions of it, um, and uh, it, I just we get I get a new foreign translation. It seems like once every week or two, uh, you know, coming from someplace. That I've lectured a lot in Euro- Europe in the last um, couple of years, last three years, and I have to tell you, in Europe, uh, they are really taking this message really seriously. Uh, in some ways, I think more seriously than we do here in the States. That's, and, that's uh, fantastic. That, that's you know, very exciting. When you did the research for the China study, I'm assuming that the Chinese at that time, and probably even now, ate primarily white rice, and yet they were slimmer than Americans, healthier, and more disease-free. Why do you think rice in our country, white rice particularly, is just so vilified? Well, it's it's really, to some extent, it ought to be vilified in China, too. As a matter of fact, if you go back and... Uh, if you're familiar with the history of nutrition to some extent, especially the discovery of vitamins, white rice, white rice, you know, stripped of its bran layer, uh, has been stripped of its uh, vitamin content, for example, and, uh, and including one B, uh, vitamin B1 called thiamine. And in fact, the discovery, the discovery of the uh, disease called beriberi, B-E-R-I-B-E-R-I, the discovery of beriberi was in Asia. And it was related to their work with the Asians at that time uh, consuming white rice. And uh, so it wasn't the best food even at that time. Wow. It's very interesting history. And the white rice that was actually uh, used, it, it, in a sense, so the story goes, I'm, I can't you know, validate this and I'm not that familiar with it, but the story is told that in Asia they wanted, once they became familiar with the Western white world, if you will, yeah. Uh, every it seemed like everything had to be white, and uh, you know that's one story. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's kind of interesting. But they got into using white rice. That's their staple. Uh, it's not that bad. 
because they also they didn't eat uh, processed foods and they didn't eat animal foods. So they had a really big leg up in a sense, even though they weren't getting the, work, the rice quite right. Right. <coughs> you know, um, so. I recently came across an article from a, that was I read online. I posted on my Facebook page about a Dr. John Kelly of Ireland who is using your book, The China Study, to treat his cancer patients, and it's now documented in a book called Stop Feeding Cancer. How does that feel that somebody's using your book in their medical practice? Well, that was spectacular, I say, in, in many different ways. I've since gotten this book. I didn't know this gentleman, uh, but I got the book. It's a small book, and, and uh, yeah, he. What, what I like about that book and what I like about Dr. Kelly is the fact, and I still haven't met him yet, but what I really liked about him is what he was a very careful and, quite frankly, reasonably conservative physician. And, you know, treating his patients as, you know, modern medicine would have him do it. Uh, but then it turned out, and he tells a story in the book that he had a friend uh, he called Patty. Um, and Patty told him about, uh, you know, he ought, to, he ought to take a look at this book called The China Study. And uh, so he finally got around to reading it. And, and uh, his friend Patty as he described it in the book, I said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. He was describing a friend of mine uh, when graduate, from graduate school at Cornell. And, and this Patty guy is, is quite a good friend. I've stayed in touch with him over the years. In fact, he became a very prominent, very famous geneticist, actually. In fact, he was slated to be the executive the director general of the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. He's a professor at Trinity College in uh, in uh, in Dublin, and in any case, it, it all came sort of home, and my good friend uh, Patty, or Pat Cunningham, is, essentially, um, he had something to do with this, and so we're cranking up, and and uh, Dr. Kelly and I are going to be meeting each other. We've exchanged a couple of emails, and we're just now uh, hoping that we can uh, set up a, set up something to be on national TV That's and to show as, as early as possible, because that that story, what he did, and how he handled it. I mean, he's a very professional man. He's sort of, I think philosophy is one of his favorite uh, sort of bylines in a sense. And, and as he looked at this question, he discussed throughout the whole book, you know, what was wrong with me? How did I ever, how did I never ever nar- navigate, you know, this, uh, this professional community? Uh, and he kept speculating about that and talking about it because he was running into the same situation when he would run into his colleagues, his fellow colleagues, you know, in medicine, and you tell him, hey, this book, and tell him about me or something like that, and some of them would think he's crazy, right. you know, as was I crazy. And uh, But he kept on at it, and finally, uh, you know, he got these amazing results uh, doing what we suggested to do in the China study. So, I don't know, it's, it, if it plays out right, um, what his work has shown is, uh, you know, with real people, is what basically I offered in the China study, what our, showed, what our work showed in the laboratory. And I, I don't know where that's going to go, but I, just for the sake of the message itself, I hope it goes someplace. Uh, because um, if all, if you know, here, if I can say it this way, and this kind of rings, rings true, really resonates in a, in a sense. What we, what I ended up really having in the China study, what our work showed, and what now Dr. Kelly has shown with his patients, it boils down to this. It basically turns out that the most revered of all nutrients for all of us, that's namely protein, especially protein. animal-based protein, yes. the most revered of all nutrients causing the most feared of all diseases. The most I mean, that's revered. a pretty amazing statement. I love it. The most revered becomes the most feared. That's, that's, that's true. No, the, you know, the most, that's right. In a sense, the most revered actually causing, causing. causing the most feared of all diseases. That's cancer. Yeah, that's amazing. And, um, you know, maybe he will eventually be able to inspire some of more, more of his colleagues to do that. Because I know that not all your colleagues always treat you so, in such a favorable manner. I was witness to this. Um, in 2011, you spoke at USC, and I had catered the dinner, and I believe there was about 200 physicians there. And you were on a panel, and you were presenting your findings, and there was one gentleman, I don't want to say his name, but he was quite well known at USC. And he just didn't like what you said. And he stormed out and he slammed the door. And I personally thought that was kind of rude. And you didn't, you reacted just very much like a gentleman. I don't know what I would have done if it was me. And I remember calling up Dr. Esselstyn the next day because I felt so, I was so mad and I felt so upset by it. And I said, and he didn't get mad and he didn't, you know, yell at him and he, and, and he didn't say anything. And, you know what, and Dr. Esselstyn said to me something that his father had told him. 
which was that the greatness of a man could be measured by what's bothering, what bothers him. And I thought, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. But, I mean, it, it, you don't seem to get your feathers ruffled, Dr. Campbell. Well, I, I can't now any longer. The feathers have all sort of drifted away, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, I've been uh, vilified and attacked uh, so many times. But, you know, I had a great career, of course, yeah. and I that's a real <laughs> treasure for me. And yeah. And I, I know that the way people behave, and I'm writing about that, by the way, just right now, just today I was writing about that as the update to our China study, trying to, you know, dig a little deeper into this whole question, you know, of why why there's such hostility on the yeah. part of some people. It's a, it's a fascinating concept. So I kind of look at it as a as a puzzle to be solved, you know, you know the I behavior think, of these people that do that. But I think that's anyhow. A- Unfortunately, I think it's going to be after you're gone that people are going to then say, wow, he was always right. Just like any time, you know, when people thought that, remember at one point, they thought the earth was flat and anybody that challenged that, you know, they were killed, you know. And so yeah. I think I think you're just, you're you're a pioneer, you're before your time. And, and I think I think that's often what happens to, to people of your stature, great people, and that, that you may not be popular at the time, but, but history will prove you right. And, and I think there should be comfort in knowing that. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned taking the eCornell course was that there's nothing we can get on an animal based diet that we can't get in a better or more utilizable form in a plant based diet with the exception of B12. And so one of the graduates from your course, Julie had a question about that. She said that in the course you advise methyl B12 supplementation is the only supplement needed on a whole food plant based diet. She wanted to know what is the dose, though, for infants and children? Like, is it the same dose? What dose do you recommend? And should the infants and toddlers be given a liquid dose? Well, I can't, I can't be too specific on that. I'm not a physician. I'm not a pediatrician right. especially. Right. So I, I really would care, I don't care to uh, give too much detail on that because I sure. can't. Right. Uh, but at the same time, my colleagues, including our daughter-in-law, that's Tom's wife, who's a physician herself, and mm-hmm. she got a lot of, did some special work in uh, pediatrics. Uh, they they have uh, they're convinced uh, and they just had a baby it's a grandchild of ours now um, and they're putting the baby on some B12 I don't know what they're giving the baby but um, gosh well, I wish well, I did know but I, I don't know, that's okay because you know we're going to be interviewing doc- the other Dr Campbell on March 5th and that was oh he'll tell you but yeah. but you know. This brings up a large issue that we've had a lot of questions about, which is supplementation. And you say this whole about the, this reductionist thinking that, that you, we need a symphony of nutrients found in the apple, not just one component. But the this supplement industry, it's, it's like a billion-dollar industry, and they're always funding these studies that this specific isolated nutrient does this. And, and But it, but you believe that really when you do that, it, it really does more harm than good. Can you talk a little bit about how we need the synergistic effect of eating the whole food as opposed to the effect of eating these isolated nutrients. That's the uh, that's the core of the uh, whole concept of uh, holism, if you will. Right. Uh, it turns out it's not it's not just a billion dollar industry right now. Uh, it's thirty two billion dollars, you know, nutrient supplements, and it's huge. Oh And, boy. and uh, over half the people are using supplements. Wow. And, you know, it's not that these supplements are are going to be hurting a lot of people uh, necessarily, especially if they're just used in small amounts. But the, but the big question is, I mean, the big issue as much as anything else, they don't work. You know, in the short run, they may look like they don't work. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the short run, they may, they look like they do work. In other words, people take a supplement, it goes up in the blood a bit, and, and so it's, oh, that's a good thing. It goes up, I was low, I needed some of that, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Well, that's not a good test of the value of those those kind of nutrients. But more to the point, there's lots of studies showing that, when nutrient supplements are used alone like that, out of the context of the food, they actually cause problems. Yes. I mean, omega-6, I mean, sorry, omega-3, for example, and 89 studies have been summarized. And, and uh, in one, one case, in another case, there was like 9 million person years worth of, I think it was 9 million, uh, it was a very, very large study. It shows that as the omega-3 supplements increased in dosage, it actually increases the risk of diabetes, and it's highly, highly significant. So we have a question from Dr. Nathan Gertschmeld. He says that the China study discusses casein protein, but what's the deal with whey protein aside from all the bodybuilding hype? Well, for one thing, we don't need that either. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 in some systems it doesn't look like it has quite the same properties as casein, but basically all the animal proteins, they tend to act rather like each other, not just in, you know, so let's say turn on cancer, 
but in many, many other things. They act like each other in, in for example, increasing blood cholesterol. You know, mm-hmm. casein actually increases blood cholesterol more than saturated fat by far. Wow. I did not know and, that. And, you know, the whole story about saturated fat, you know, being the cause of heart disease, we're going to have to toss that idea aside. It was really animal protein. It was known over 100 years ago, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Yeah. And so, and specifically, it was casein. It was tested back in as long ago as 75 years ago. Well, I'm, I'm sure the dairy industry does not want to know this. <laughs> no, of course they don't want to know it. And unfortunately, that's where I came from. And my first publication, in fact, is, uh, you see the first or second one is in the Journal of Dairy Science. So I was very much into that community. Um, and, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough thing. I didn't have anything against uh, that particular trade, I loved my background, my growing up on the farm. It was a great life. Uh, but just you have to face the facts. Wow. So um, uh, Patty wants to know if there's any studies in the works that show that a whole food plant-based diet can reverse cancer in humans, such as they've done like with heart disease. We know the, the studies that Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Ornish have done have shown the reversal of heart disease. But how about with cancer? Well, that's Dr. Kelly's work in in Ireland. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm just learning about. I mean, that's that's one thing I hadn't known about that, of course, until very recently. But on the other hand, there are I hear a lot of anecdotal stories about people, you know, getting rid of the, their cancer, which mm-hmm. is consistent with, you know, my biochemical work, if you will. I mean, we suspected that was true all along, but um, it's a good question. We haven't had the kind of uh, study that Dr. Esselstyn did with heart disease. I've tried to get something like that going for 25 years. But I have to tell you, when I'm talking to oncologists, they'll hear nothing of this. Right. I mean, cancer, cancer is uh, too much, uh, too much feared, and when people are diagnosed, they're very vulnerable at that point in time, and they want to go with what you know is the traditional method of of dealing with it. But it doesn't so sound the traditional method of dealing with it really works all that well. Pardon? Well, the traditional, yes, right. The tri- if we call it traditional, the use of cytotoxic drugs and radiation and stuff like that. I mean, I, I don't want to take a stand, you know, against the use of those things at this point. Uh, but I, I will venture to say that if we just had a chance to just compare this approach with that, then I'm sure we'd see big differences. And that's where Dr. Kelly comes in. Now, he's a, been a real respected um, man in his, uh, in his profession. And he never, he's a general practitioner. He got lots of cancer patients. What he did was he didn't try to argue with his oncology friends. He he sent his patients over to the oncology specialist, and, and they would do what they had to do. But what Dr. Kelly had done in the meanwhile, he just made sure, if possible, to get them a whole food plant-based diet, and they just recovered remarkably well. Right. So I mean, that's that's what that's, he did. Like the few oncologists that I've met or talked to, it, you know, I'm, even if you believe in radiation and chemotherapy and surgery, What's wrong with also improving your diet? Many of them take a stand that diet is absolutely of no importance, that it doesn't matter at all. And that, that, how can that be right, you know? That, that's, that's the crime. That's yeah. really the issue. And, you know, when people in the profession, uh, you know, of any kind, when they, uh, you know, when they sort of want to close the book, they don't want to read the book, they don't want to see the film, they don't want to hear anything talk, anybody talking about this, that is extremely unprofessional. Right. And I would say unethical. Right. And so uh, they're supposed to be professionals. They're supposed to be, you know, scientifically oriented. Uh, you know, Hippocrates said uh, long ago the, to the physician, and that's their modern day oath, you know, the physician should do no harm. Right. Well, I, I'd like to just, you know, offer that idea to a lot of these people who are so reluctant to even talk about it, you know, that they took the Hippocratic oath. And when they took the oath, they agreed that they would do no harm. Right. Well, I would just ask him, do you think you're doing harm? When you give them, the, you know, all these are very poisonous drugs. Well, but isn't part me that you're not. Yeah, exa- I, I agree with you. But don't you think part of the problem, and, you know, both my brothers are physicians, my uncles, my grandfather was one, and many of my cousins and nieces and nephews. And when they graduate medical school, I invariably say to them, so what would you learn about nutrition? And the answer is, like, pretty much nothing. Or, you know, something like, oh, well, if I have a burn patient, they need more calories. Uh, nutrition is not even being taught in medical school. Isn't that Absolutely. a problem? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've lectured now, and I don't know what the count is, but I've you know, given about 600 lectures all over the place since the book came out in, 19, in 2005. But in recent times, the majority have been to medical schools. 
and uh, it's it's that's great fun, uh, and I'm pretty candid with what I say. Uh, and uh, I'm actually finding a lot of response from that community, from a lot of people. Uh, so there's real bright side there. In fact, I'm I'm getting a better response from, you know, uh, physicians coming out of the woodwork, uh, and really wanting to try this or more know more about it. I'm getting a better response from the medical community than I'm getting from my fellow scientists in in the laboratory. And that's so sure. interesting. That is so interesting. It, well, it is. It's really quite interesting. Are you familiar with the work of Walter Longo at USC on fasting and cancer? No, I know the name. I, I'm I'm sorry, I have not. No, in fact, okay. looked at the details that's of that. Right. That's all right, because Dr. Goldhammer talks a lot about it, and I, uh, we we re- we had him on the on the show recently. I, and I don't want to quote something and be mistaken, but it's something to the effect of that even when you obviously this was animal research, and I know we have a lot of listeners that are opposed to that, and I respect that. But what it's showing is that these rats with cancer, the ones that fasted even when they got the the treatment that they would normally give people like the radiation or the chemotherapy, that they did much better when they fasted than if they didn't, you know, when, yeah. when they got these treatments. I'd say from a more theoretical point of view, from the scientific point of view, that's not surprising. And as a matter of fact, I've been involved a little bit in the fasting discussion, if you will. Mm-hmm. I've done it myself. Uh, and I know Dr. Goldhammer, a very good friend, really fantastic guy. Uh, he's been doing his thing, and uh, we got some of his data that actually uh, helped him to publish it. We published, you know, published it together. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really familiar with that. In fact, the the professor who first did the, um, you know, the uh, starving of oil, cutting down on calories, was uh, my professor when I got my master's at Cornell way back in the late 50s, with Dr. Clive McKay. He's the one who started that in the 1930s and 40s. And so I, I can believe what Dr. Longo is saying. I, now that you remind me, I'm going to go and get up to date. I'll well, you know, I, I have I've, I've been in contact with him. I have his email if you, if you'd like to talk to him because I think it's 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 you know this is this is all this is being done at USC, so this this might be right up your alley. You had mentioned your professor, and one of the things I'm going to ask you, I ask just about every guest, is who you know when I talk to other people about who inspired them, what made them become plant based. I mean, a lot of people instead of writing questions, they wrote things like. Tell him I love him. He saved my life. Aloha from Hawaii, Lorraine. Veg- you know, a lot of people just sent their love. And a lot of people say you, they, they, you inspired them. But who inspired you, either personally or professionally? Well, I've been asked that question before, and I, I've got a number of uh, people uh, older than I when I was young who inspired me, but not because they were discovering this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ones who inspired me most were the ones who actually cared. Mm. They're the ones who actually were the most human and who most cared. Mm. Um, and, and they were doing work, you know, for the sake of the public. And they were doing work, you know, in a very honorable way. And, uh, and it was always with the thought in mind that they took great pleasure in, let's say, learning something that might be useful for the public. Yeah. And, and I can name four or five, you know, people like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, and I have to always put in my dad in this. I was very close to my yeah. father. Right. Yeah, who was a farmer, and that, that's what he had a great reputation in the county as a farmer, as having you know extraordinary integrity. So the story went, and I know he did. You and, know, I think, um, I think if we looked up integrity in the dictionary, there'd probably be your picture there, because that's one of the things I most admire about you and your humil and, and, and your humility as well. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I feel very strongly about it. I wish we, you know, it ought to be a natural thing to do, but. Unfortunately, we get reminded that it's not entirely natural because too many people don't necessarily abide by that. Right. Well, you know, that you know philosophy. when I think of you, I th- you know, you and Dr. Esselstyn to me are like two peas in a pod. You know, in so many ways, I I just love you both so much. You sort of, in a way, have led parallel lives, and I don't think that you guys even realize this because. But like when I see you, because I've had the privilege of speaking at conferences, like where you both were speakers, and. I don't. Do you realize the buzz that you create? That like you're like the you're like you're the Rolling Stones. You guys are like the rock stars of the plant based world. I, are you even aware of this, or you're just you're just oblivious to like that you guys are just these superstars? No, I, I, I guess I'm aware of it. I you know very nice things have happened. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of standing ovations. I guess, I guess you could say more recent times. I'm, I'm very conscious of that and very gratified that you know people have benefit from this information yeah uh that that's really what matters that they yeah. 
you know, have learned this and are doing something with it. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very nice. Right. So, and, and but, I, but at the same time, I want to, I really do want to stick, to, of course, to, you know, to stick with the message and get it right, and so every, everybody can learn about it and share it. And what, yeah. what amazes me is you're, you know, you're about 25 years older than me, and and I thought I traveled a lot, but you're you travel all the time, other cities, other countries. I mean, you you don't you don't rest, I don't think at all. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing a little bit too much, I think, lately. Uh, I'm going to have to slow down a little bit. But, uh, yeah, it's always fun to meet other people, though, because it's a learning experience as well. Well, uh, if, if, people, like if people want to meet you, I'm going to recommend that they go on the plant-based cruise in March because I think that's a great way to meet you where you're not giving, you know, a million lectures a day. And, you know, you actually hang out like a regular person. I remember seeing you up at the Midnight Buffet one night. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I should tell you now that you mentioned that uh, Nelson's going to be there, by the way, and he's Correct. going to be showing the show the film uh, Plant Pure Nation. So we're going to see it before its actual release date, huh? That, oh yes, that's right. In fact, I should also say too that um, during April and May, presently, we have scheduled a cross-country tour uh, to show the film in about 20 or so cities around the country, and uh, we're, you know that's part of the business of creating a you know theater based film as I'm sure you know. Uh mm-hmm. we're gonna be showing and screening around, get getting some feel for how well it's gonna do uh before it's released into the theaters on uh, July fourth. Wow. So, so if you want to see the movie first, you need to sign up for the Holistic Holiday at Sea Cruise, March 14th through 21st. You can see Dr. Campbell. You can see myself. And also, if you want to see Dr. Campbell, he's going to be at the New Year, New You Health Fest in Marshall, Texas. I believe it's the 27th uh, through the 29th. And so you'll be, will you be showing the film there as well or just in, just on the cruise? I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I don't okay. think so, but I, I, that's yet to be worked out. We might. Okay. You know, so. but, but you will be there. So those, these are opportunities for people to attend right. wonderful events with like-minded people, and, and they'll actually get to see you in person. So we have a, a, a great question from Sharon, and this is on one of your favorite subjects, research. And she wants to know, what is the latest research on cancer prevention? Does it still support eating more of certain types of plant foods, such as cruciferous vegetables, to prevent cancer? No. Um, you know, the, I, I know the group uh, fairly well who started that story about cruciferous vegetables. Uh, they were both at University of Minnesota as well mm-hmm. as at Johns Hopkins. And, uh, I, and as I, I knew that these people, especially the gentleman at uh, University of Minnesota, uh, Lee Wattenberg, um, it just so happens that he, at that time he was sort of into, he was a pathologist and he was working with some chemicals and he discovered some chemicals in plants and it just so happens he I don't know, picked up a cabbage head or something and found it there. And so, it, you know, the cruciferous vegetables then took on, in a sense, almost a life of their own, in a sense. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, they're, I mean, they're good. They're, they're very good. But uh, the point is that you can also get just another batch of very similar kinds of chemicals from virtually all the plants. Right. And, so uh, we, so, we don't need to worry about eating flaxseed every day to prevent breast cancer, so that's all just no. Pipe. I, yeah, that, it's the kind of it's the kind of thing I don't tend to get into. You know, it, we we too we obsess I think too much on details, right? And you know, trying to make everything just exactly right, and maybe we want to make sure that we get enough of this, that, or something else, and maybe overdo it. Who knows? Um, but the, the, in reality, the biggest message of all is just eating these whole plant-based foods, keep mm-hmm. getting good a good variety going, uh, and uh, include a lot of the there's more colored kinds of vegetables because that color that's imparted to plants is actually attributed to a certain chemical property of some of the antioxidants in the plants. And mm-hmm. so when you see color, you can expect to see a lot of antioxidation, I mean, a lot of antioxidant activity. And so okay. that's the general rule of thumb that I tend to follow. Uh, yams are good as far as tubers. I mean, it's uh, it's quite interesting. There's some information yeah. showing that yellow, the yellow sort of tubers are better than white. Wow, I love uh, I love yams and sweet potatoes. I love the purple ones. Have you ever had the purple ones from Hawaii? Yeah, yes, I have. Yeah, they're good. They're, they're good. Del- they're they're delicious. Just as long as we're yeah. talking about food, what is your favorite food? If you were if you were going to be executed for a crime you didn't commit, and they said, okay, what 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 would your last meal be? Something that my wife fixed, whatever it was. Oh. Oh God! You are just so you're just adorable, Doctor Campbell. It just I wish I could just hug you. 
computer right now. You are just, you're just so sweet. Here's a kind of a fun question. It's not really uh, that scientific, but I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm going to include it. Uh, Jeannie wants to, uh, has said that Bob Hope, who lived to be 100, said that what, what helped his longevity or what created his longevity was getting a daily massage. How do you feel about that? Would Dr. Campbell perhaps recommend regular massage treatments as well? How do I know? I, I don't know whether regular or not. I, I can't. I, I, you know, but I, it's really nice. I, yeah. I have to say it's a nice practice. <laughs> Of that, there's, it's obvious. Uh, you know, I'd go for it, but I'm yeah. no different than anyone else. I, I you know, <laughs> if it relaxes and calms. That's a great thing. Sure. What sure. else can I say? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Scott said that he says Dr. Campbell declared that animal protein being the most carcinogenic substance he had ever studied. How does he feel about the current research on animal protein? Does he think it's trending towards his opinion, and does he still hold his opinion, or does he go with the newer research? I don't even know what he's talking about, what newer research maybe you do. Well, he might be talking about uh, a little series of uh, uh, very short comments I'm making presently on our website. Um, mm-hmm. That's nutritionstudies.org. It's, our, it's, the, uh, it's the group that you know we have our online courses. And so I've start, I started a series on there, or I should say my colleagues have started a series, and I contribute to it. Uh, it's called a series called Provocations, and uh, I've, I've started this thing where, you know, I make a very provoking comment, uh, just a few words, and the first one was casein is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. Mm. That's pretty, very provoking. I don't say much more than that. I get some, uh, you know, elicit some responses uh, from people, and I come back and say the second, oh, okay, you heard me say it's the most relevant carcinogen. Everybody else might disagree, but... I'm going to say it again. It is. And then I show them the, the fundamental sort of data to show that it is. And um, it's a, the, the thing about protein is that it has – animal protein, I should say. It has its own intrinsic properties to cause problems, you know, like increasing cholesterol as opposed to plant protein, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Um, increasing uh, excessive oxidation, you know, uh, as opposed to uh, plant protein, and, 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 and actually increasing growth factors – you know, uh, that in fact stimulate cancer growth. And animal protein has all these properties that when you test it alone, it's pretty remarkable. But there's another property of animal protein that is not usually almost never mentioned. And that is we have such a reverence for animal protein. Yeah. You know, just as protein, just as protein, you know, people talk about protein, they generally talk about animal protein. We have had such a long time reverence for that nutrient that what we do, and we need that, we have to have it. That's what everybody says, we have to have it. And and we keep on eating, eating like that, and at, you know, stacking a plate up, and pretty soon we got a paleo diet. Right. Uh, and what we've done when we do that, we are displacing all the good stuff, and then so we we're getting you're know, getting hit twice. Mm-hmm. And the dis, the displacement effect, the indirect, I'll call it indirect effects of protein, is just as prominent as the direct effects. And well, so uh, the whole idea of eating animal protein is just. It's a no-brainer. It's a, it should not be done. People should try to avoid it. End of story. Well, do you, was there a particular person or organization that started this myth of of animal protein being so revered? Because I mean, yeah, it was in 1839. 18 uh, that far back? That's that's you yes, know, it was 1839 at that when time. You just, when you were just a little boy. Yeah, I I just been around, just running around the lab at that time, but. <laughs> yeah, it's 1839, not 1939. That's uh, 18, there was a chemist in, in uh, Holland who actually uh, was the first to uh, identify this nitrogen-containing substance. They knew something about nitrogen as an atom, and he isolated that from uh, from uh, meat, essentially, and uh, he was feeding meat to the dog. And so when the, he learned at that time, uh, supposedly in these very early days, very primitive, very primitive studies, he, he learned that you know this this nitrogen containing stuff protein what if you will um, had to be there it was essential and so he gave it the name protein from the Greek word p r o t e i o s at proteos which means of prime importance so what happened was that the word protein was was baptized early on as something really life giving force it was it was everything and we need protein there's no question about that we need a certain amount. And so from that day on, um, and especially when people talk about it in the context of it being animal protein, not plant protein, it's mm-hmm. always had this very revered status it's all the way from 1839. And it's a fascinating history. You get into the late 1800s and early 1900s, and, 
and the story just continued to build, and it was like a a cheerleading crowd. And yet, you know, the longest, just you know, and then you know, you look at the longest lived people, and they're not getting they're getting very few, if any, of their calories from animal protein. That's right. I mean, we can get all the nutrients we need. Right. You know, from plant-based foods, and that's it, period. When, and we get enough you, protein. That's that's the important thing. Exactly. It's impossible to be protein deficient unless you're calorie deficient. When you were working in China and seeing what they ate, did you ever eat meals with them? Because what, what interested, me, interested me most is what were these people eating? They were eating white rice. They were eating lots of vegetables, I imagine. But, like, were they putting salt on their food? Were they put, eating sugar? Were they eating oil? I know they didn't have processed food, but what, what were they really eating? Well, it varied. I mean, there, there was a lot of variation, and that's, in fact, what made our study powerful. In other words, we had in that study a total of 130 villages that wow. we were comparing, in a sense. And, and there were 6,500 adults who were there, and we took their blood samples. I mean, we did a very extensive study, obviously. And, and the, the range of, of uh, intakes of different foods and, of course, the range of intakes of the different nutrients, it was pretty broad. Uh, but the vast majority of them, since it was in rural China, the va- vast majority of these people were consuming diets largely plant-based. Right. And some of them were almost like 100% plant-based. So what we really had an opportunity to look at was to compare across that range of intake of foods, nutrients, and so forth and so on. We could look at regressions, uh, you know, of let's say consumption of foods or consumption of nutrients versus, you know, the diseases that, that were most common in those areas. And uh, so it was. It was that kind of study. It was a. Um, it wasn't just on individuals. Yeah. Uh, and we we weren't doing so-called intervention studies like you know giving some people this kind of food and see what happens. We didn't do that. This was an observational kind of study yeah. where we just wanted to see, you know, what what's related to what here. Yeah. That's, and, uh, um, that's just so fascinating. I wish uh, this is just that 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 whole study just it just intrigues me. It just seems just so amazing that you were able to even create something like that. You know, that was the first study between the United States and China, by the way. Wow. And that whole I, that whole idea at the time that was kind of fascinating. It was a very exciting uh, part of and, my and, life, and I now, guess, in a sense. And now I hear that China is trying to emulate us with the McDonald's and with the obesity. Oh yeah. Doing so well yeah. when they were when they were not uh, trying to to Americanize. So I, this well, they started that. They started that like 30 years ago, almost. I mean, uh, McDonald's had come running over. They were doing everything they could. The dairy industry came charging in. They were doing everything they could to get things going. And and I, I've lectured in China for a bit there for some years ago. And I would say to them, you know, why do you take our bad stuff? You know, yeah. just like everything American. And I had to That's kind of so tell them. And these were physicians too. You know, why don't you just yeah. do your own stuff? Because they had it. The funny thing is, is they had it right. You know, that's the funny. Yeah, thing. That's right. And rural China, and, and and you know other societies too. And it was sort of the older times. Sure. That's what we were mostly eating. Was uh, mostly plant based stuff. Yep. I, throughout most of human history, actually. You know, I have a feeling right. I know how you're going to answer this other question from Sharon, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What do you believe is the key to getting this information out to the masses? Is it going to be more effective to convince the medical community, or is it best as a grassroots effort? It's going to have to be grassroots, and I've given a lot of thought to that because I spent about 20 years mm-hmm. in uh, policy uh, development on expert panels and things like that, giving testimony before congressional committees. And you know, I mean, it was really up to my eyeballs and that kind of thing, thinking a lot about you know, how do you get this information to the public, sort of help it to develop these national policy statements, if you will. Uh, I once thought that you know, if we get, get some of the top people to understand and accept this and buy into it, uh, that would work. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. Bottom line, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, that took some years to finally let that sink in. And therefore, the only way that it's going to happen, it has to be grassroots. And that means basically, first and foremost, making people aware. So things like this, just like what you're doing now, or you know, coming out with books or films or you know, uh, doing some of these immersion programs that – you know, my son and some others are doing, um, you know, anything that, that can enlighten the public, raise their level of consciousness, you know, of the value of this, and also let, raise their level of consciousness about what it does. We now know that a lot of the problems we have, really serious problems like cost of health care, like environmental damage, like the unnecessary violence in the world. I mean, these things are all traced back to one thing. This is what you put on your plate, you know, what we decide to eat. 
And, uh, you know, people have got to be formed to this. So it is about awareness. And uh, our son has a in the trailer to, you know, Plant Pure Nation. I would, incidentally, people are listening, of course, um, you can see the trailer to this film, uh, Plant Pure Nation, by going to YouTube. Just put go to YouTube, mm-hmm. uh, put in Plant Pure Nation, and you'll see a trailer. It's a great and trailer. One sta- Excellent. And one, one statement in there that I really like, uh, because it just hits the nail right on the head to answer this question. And that is our son, who, he's the director. Toward the end, he and I are presenting to a big rally in Louisville, Kentucky, about a, million, about a thousand people. And uh, he gets pretty impassioned about one comment, and that's in the trailer. He said, revolutions, you know, in order for them to happen, they only happen by people becoming aware. Yeah. They have to be aware. And that's what... Right now, you know, knowledge is power. We know that. Sure. We've known it for centuries. And the whole question is, who's controlling the knowledge? Mm. Well, we want, to cha- we want to change that dynamic. You know, yep. I'm tired of the, the forces in our world who are the powerful and the rich. They're the ones who have controlled the knowledge. They know what they're doing. Yeah. They're controlling knowledge. And so that's what we need to change. Change the knowledge. Or, yeah, we, that's what we need, the plant, the plant revolution. Well, this is a great. This was a great question to end on. I so appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us. If people want to find out more about you, the eCornell course, what's the best website we can send them to? Uh, nutritionstudies.org. Great. Okay. And uh, now they can start going to Plant Pure Nation as well. That's uh, getting up and going. It's going to be quite a rich site, too, as the film gets going. Um yeah, that's the thing. Our our daughter's got something too. Uh, I have to say that she don't mind. No, that's um, not- it's that's uh, global. Um, I guess what's it called? Global leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, she uh, was in the Peace Corps. She got her doctorate in education. She's been, you know, working in the Dominican Republic uh, off and on over the years with students, taking them there as teachers. She's she's uh, sort of the radical in the family. Well, that's and, Leanne. Uh, yeah, she, she's yeah. Been, like me. We're always radical. She she's the author of several uh, wonderful China study cookbooks. That's right, she is, and she just held uh, with her her colleague, uh, a cardiologist from Canada. It was actually his conference, but she worked with him, and they held a conference down in the Dominican Republic um, the last December, and she's going to be doing more of those going forward. And uh, she has a um, a uh, website too. I think it's Global Leadership. That's what I'm really now I'm embarrassed to forget exactly what it's called. That's okay. Um, we won't we, we won't tell her that. We yeah, <laughs> it's it's Le, yeah, Leanne Campbell. She had changed it not too long ago. It's kind of yeah. lost well, my you know, tongue here a little bit. You've got so many. But, you've got 18 children and grandchildren. How can you how can you remember everybody's website? You know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, any, anyhow, we're having a lot of fun. I, I just right. hope other people do too. Yeah. yeah, it's so great that you have your whole family, you know, doing this with you. It must be just so rewarding that they really uh, support your work and are doing pretty much the same work, but in their own way. So I can't imagine. That's right. They're, in, they're each doing their own thing. Yeah, and yeah. Then, I mean, what a, what a great legacy you've already left behind. And so thank you so much again for being here. Thank all of you for listening. I do apologize for the glitches at times, but this was still well worth listening to. I'm sure you agree. And Dr. Campbell, happy, healthy New Year. I wish you and your family just the very best because you've done so much for so many people. And just keep on keeping on. We love you so much. Uh, give love to Karen, and thank you all for listening. And I'm Chef AJ. This is Healthy Living, and I make healthy taste delicious. Good night, everybody. Good night, Dr. Campbell. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you.